Oh, oh, I guess maybe. I don't know. Does anyone have any questions about student unions in general? Um, I used to help the LSU back when I was an undergrad at SFU, so I do have some insight into what they do if anyone has questions about that. Yeah, that's about uh, how in interested people were in uh, the LSU when I was an undergrad too. Uh, do you know anything about which courses will be offered in person following the announcement? I have no idea. Uh, the university decided that stuff today and that will be probably communicated to instructors and professors over the next month or two. Uh, the chain of communication is uh, very slow usually and the people at the very top make the decisions and that is passed down through the um, deans which is passed down to the chairs which is passed down to the professors which is passed down to the instructors which is it, it's a very long chain so um they'll probably know by the time enrollment starts which would be in uh july Okay, so here is uh, animal communication stuff. Um, feel free to interrupt me anytime about questions you might have had about the practice exercise. Uh, I looked at the Excel sheet, so I know which ones were problematic, but these are pretty reflective of which ones were problematic. Okay, uh, which of the following design features have not been found to be present in any animal communication system? This was actually a question from week one that was reiterated from last week. So the answers here are recursion and creativity. Uh, no animal communication system has found either of these. Uh, semanticity and arbitrariness have been found in many systems and learnability, we saw the bird songs. So learnability is being able to figure out other dialects and with bird songs, we found that they can do this. So males can learn the bird songs of other dialects in order to get closer. So recursion, no animals have found this and creativity is the same idea here. Uh, no animal can express whatever thought it has uh, within its own system. Uh, this one was also uh, struggled a little bit. Uh, why would animal communication have redundancy? Uh, this was what the Wegel dance was about and expressed how we said that uh, the, the waggle dance happens, but there's also some pheromones that are released at the site, and also the bees take the food from the site and bring it back to the hive. So they do three things to make sure that eventually the bees can find the food. So in general, the purpose of that redundancy is to make sure that, you know, the communication is successful. They can actually find the food. So our system has redundancy, so that way our message gets across. Uh, Morse code was done really well. So dots and dashes, these are just arbitrary. Uh, the fact that certain dots and certain dashes correspond to certain letters, I mean, uh, it's just determined that that's how it was. If we change those dots and dashes, then they would correspond to different letters and we would have learned it that way and that would have been fine. Uh, this was done quite well. Sign language was done very well. Yesterday, I went to the store to get a mango. Uh, went is redundant, the past tense, because yesterday already specifies it was in the past. Uh, it's grammatical. We need went to be in the past tense, but we don't actually need to say went to understand that it was in the past, because yesterday already specifies it. We need it for grammaticality purposes, but for understanding, it's fine. If we said yesterday, I go to the store to get a mango, we would still understand exactly what it meant. We just got rid of the redundancy. It sounds bad, but we understand it. Uh, these were all done very well, these true or false questions. Um, the monkeys, the monkeys. Okay, I I'll talk about the monkeys. All of these monkeys have arbitrariness. Sarah, I think, was the most obvious one because it said right in the slides, Sarah used these little symbols that were arbitrary. Like there was a triangle that represent apple. And yeah, triangle has nothing to do with apple. But all of these other monkeys used American sign language. And the different signs are all arbitrary. 
Like the sign, the hand signal for, for cat has nothing to do with cat in the real world. It's an arbitrary gesture. So when these monkeys are learning the hand gesture for cat, they could have learned any gesture at all to mean cat. They could have learned something that wasn't ASL and they still would have been able to do it. So because all of these monkeys were able to use American Sign Language to communicate that idea of cat or that idea of good, whatever words that they learned, uh, they all were able to demonstrate some uh, notion of arbitrariness. Uh, so uh, this wasn't necessarily talking about the monkey communication, like their own inherent system as monkeys with their calls. This was more so about uh, within their experiment with their sign language, uh, with how they communicated to the humans through ASL or through the symbols. Uh, what they did there was arbitrary. So all of them demonstrated that. With the discrete signs, a lot of people had some issues with a picture of clouds in the sky. So signs are either discrete or graded. If it's graded, it's continuous. So like temperature changing or sound changing, but a picture is just an image. When you see an image, there's no gradual change to it. It's just like there. So this is something that's discrete. It's like a light switch that's on or off. The picture is either there or it's not. It's just a still image. So that can be discrete. Uh, that might have been very different from what we saw before with the other examples, but that's still something that's just there. It's just a picture of a cloud. It's discrete. It's sort of like the number one. One is a discrete number. Um, this question, the true or false about the display of arbitrariness, I gave you the point no matter whether you said yes or no, because the way that I worded the description of the Laird uh, was not quite the way I intended to word it in a clear way. So um, the way that I worded it was really like no evidence provided, which would lead you to say false. The way I intended it to come across was true. So whether you said true or false, it should have been regraded to uh, full marks. So if for some reason your best attempt with this is not regraded to 0.3 out of 3, uh, let me know when I will update your score, but they all should be regraded to perfect for this particular question. And then I believe the rest of these uh, were done quite well. So um, were there any questions I didn't go over here that you would like me to go over about the practice exercise? Last week, you'd mentioned points for the phonetic constraint question. Do we get the extra point for getting it right? You should have got the point for getting it right. Um, if that was not updated, I can fix that after lecture. Just um, on, on your practice quiz, if you did not get the point in the comment section, just leave a comment there and I will update it. Um, but you should have got an extra point three. So add up all your points for that best attempt. And if it doesn't add up to your score plus 0.3, um, just add a little comment there and I'll get an email notification and I'll update it. I didn't regrade the specific question on the page, so it doesn't go from zero to 0 0.3, but when you add up your total, you should have an extra 0.3 above the total. So could we get over 100% technically? No. So I only added 0.3 to the people who got the phonetic constraint question incorrect. So I basically just like voided the note. So if you got the question right, there's no need to comment. Yeah, I basically just avoided that question. Uh, Trevor, just a question. Yep. 
Um, so for the yards or yards, the birds basically question. Yeah. Um, one of them was uh, the animal above shows design feature of pre-verification, which is to be able to tell lies, etc. Yep. Now, uh, eventually we figured out which is which. However, um, I got a little bit confused. The reason why I first said false, because I thought about, you know, the examples that we had in lecture saying that, you know, birds may do this instinctually or intentionally or not intentionally. We don't know that. So I thought it'd be no evidence provided or no for that case. So um, the answer was true. Um, and, you know, that also makes sense too, but I don't know what is there for the explanation for this one. Uh, so for this one, uh, oh, I get it because in the description I said a type of bird. Uh, yeah, this was just supposed to be a new independent animal. So my last line was just uh, when Larids fight for territory, they can use their squeaks to mislead other flocks of Larids to trick them. So the idea mm -hmm. here in my description was that this was intentional. Um, okay. I probably could have just put the word intentionally here, but um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right, sounds good. Just wanted to clarify and figure that out a little bit more. Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, th th this will be a good point going forward too. For the imaginary animals I make, and this will be imaginary on your test too, uh, so that way you can't just uh, use Google, uh, senior Google to solve everything. Um, the imaginary animals will be independent from everything else. So these imaginary animals can be uh, much more intelligent or much less intelligent than animals in the real world. Okay, well, if anyone does have any other questions about these, again, feel free to post on the discussion board or join the Discord or email me at any time and uh, bug me or office hour appointments or office hours or uh, whatever. I'm happy to answer questions whenever you have them. Oh, can you explain which two design features are primarily responsible for our ability to generate an infinite number of meaningful words? Oh, this comes directly from the lecture slides. So this one was the discreteness and duality of patterning. So discreteness, the discreteness gives us the ability to uh, separate or, or find really small, meaningless units. So for instance, in English, this gives us sounds and individual sounds are meaningless. And then duality of patterning lets us take those meaningless units and combine them into larger, meaningful units. So like discreteness gives us p, i, t, and then duality of patterning would give us pit. So we need those two things together to give us an infinite number of meaningful words. So um, arbitrariness just tells us that the words we produce um, and the thing in the real world, the connection between those things uh, doesn't have like a meaningful connection. Uh, I shouldn't say meaningful. Um, I should say that the sounds that we produce and the thing in the real world don't resemble each other. That's what arbitrariness says. So when I say mouse and I pulled up this thing, uh, you know, this there's nothing about the pronunciation of mouse that would represent this. Uh, creativity doesn't let us generate an infinite number of meaningful words. It just lets us express infinite ideas. Creativity is about expression. Duality of patterning is about um, giving us the ability to like pronounce and produce things. Yeah, so uh, there's there are there is some subtlety in these. Uh, but yeah, that one was, was almost directly from the lecture slides. And that's also why I said specifically two design features, because I know that creativity, I, that's also why I left creativity off of this list, because I thought that creativity would be a little bit too close and too distracting, um, because uh, that, would be, that would be very, very misleading at that point. So I left that one off the list. 
There's a difference between a challenging question and a tricky question. And creativity would be tricky. Without creativity, I think this is challenging. It's my goal to be challenging, not to be tricky. Okay. Um, yeah, let's start with uh, sounds, words, and sentences. So if you've taken Linguistics 220 Introduction to Linguistics, or if you're going to take it, uh, this is sort of like a whirlwind tour through a lot of the basics of that course. And a lot of what we learned this week is about theoretical language. And it's going to cover uh, stuff that we need to understand first language acquisition, second language acquisition, um, experimental linguistics, computational linguistics, and some of the basics of sociolinguistics. So um, everything that we learn this week, well, different aspects of it will set us up to have more in-depth discussions about uh, later things in the course. So that way, when we talk about, you know, first language acquisition, uh, we can say more than just babies learn sounds in an order. We can actually talk about specific sounds and specific problems uh, and actually do some, some problems and say, okay, what are the issues that the baby's facing and not just here are some general issues that babies can face. So everything in this lecture is practical that we're doing. And the exercises that you're doing this week and the practice exercises are practical. Um, so we'll do quite a bit of practice. Okay, so when you think of grammar, typically you think of sentence structure, but grammar starts at the sound level. It goes to how syllables are put together. It goes to how words are put together, sentences are put together, how meaning is constructed and how to conversation is constructed as well. So each of these different levels is a different subfield in linguistics. So phonetics studies sounds. Uh, phonology is about sound patterns. Uh, morphology is about word patterns. Syntax is the typical understanding of grammar, which is sentence structure. Uh, this is usually where people end up falling asleep. Uh, this is what I study. This is why I'm such a sleepy person in general. Uh, and then semantics and pragmatics is usually not discussed too much. Uh, in high school or elementary school. Um, semantics is usually a little bit heavier on mathematics and pragmatics uh, is very abstract and um, very uh, sociological. So today in this course, we're just going to talk about the first four and we're not going too in depth into these. We're just gonna cover the basics and then semantics and pragmatics. If you're interested in linguistics, there are other courses where you can talk about these things. So um, in each of these sections, you'll be responsible for different things. I'm gonna show you a lot of different stuff, but I'm gonna to try to make it very clear what you're responsible for versus just what I'm illustrating to you. So um, in each of these different subfields, there are still different parts. So for instance, in phonetics, there's three different parts of phonetics. And if you work in phonetics, you might be familiar with one and not familiar with um, all three, and that's, normal. So phonetics is all about studying individual speech sounds. And typically we start with what is called articulatory phonetics. And this is about how sounds are produced in the mouth. And this is where we'll start today. And that's all we'll do. And in an intro linguistics course, that's also all you do. Because to do other types of phonetics, you really need to know how sounds are produced. And we won't even be able to get that in depth because we only have like 40 minutes. Uh, but there's other two types of phonetics. Uh, acoustic phonetics is really interesting because this is where you start to use computers to analyze sounds. So you can talk to a computer and if you've ever used a program like Audacity or even if you've used a recording device on your phone, you can see a wave of your speech and that tracks things like how loud your speech is. Uh, you can use programs to track the pitch uh, you can track these things called formants, uh, which check to see the frequencies of your vowels. And you can notice that certain vowels have different frequencies. You can analyze that. Uh, perceptual phonetics is really interesting for second language, which we call L2 acquisition and uh, how people hear things. So for instance, I'm going to pronounce a vowel right now. And uh, 
You tell me if it sounds more like an E or if it sounds more like an OO. E. E. So tell me if that sounds more like an E or an OO. E. E. That's amazing that you're split, right? You're split. Uh, in reality, all I'm doing is I'm making an E sound, E, E, but I'm just rounding my lips. E, E. I'm making an E and I'm rounding my lips. That's all I'm doing. Uh, but your perception of it, if you speak English or other languages that don't have a rounded E, but do have a rounded O, you're thinking, okay, a rounded sound is usually in the back of my mouth. So I hear a rounded E, E, but rounded sounds are in the back. So I'm going to perceive it as a back sound. And, you know, this is perceptual phonetics. This is what you're familiar with. So you perceive a rounded sound as a back sound. Uh, that's what people who study phonetics do. So, uh, yeah, perceptual phonetics is also called auditory phonetics sometimes. So, yeah, Blair is right. It's sometimes called auditory phonetics. So, uh, we'll talk about articulatory phonetics today. And articulatory phonetics usually starts with this discussion of something called the IPA. Uh, this is not the beer. This is what's known as called the International Phonetic Alphabet. And the IPA is useful because it's a way of transcribing sounds. Now, if you know anything about English spelling, it's that it is hot garbage. As described by the sentence, a rough-coated, dough-faced, thoughtful plowman strode through Scarborough. Now, if you take a look at all of these different O-U-G-Hs, uh, all of these are pronounced differently. So uh, we're not going to learn these symbols, but uh, each of these O-U-G-Hs are given a different symbol to represent the vowel. And I'll just uh, squish myself down a little bit so you can see those words. But rough, uh, makes this uh sound. So we give it this symbol for uh, do. This is an o, aw, thoughtful, plow. It's an ow, through. That's an oo, and scarbra. That's sometimes a schwa. So these all make different sounds, but they're spelled the same. Now, if linguists want to analyze the sounds of words and how pronunciation is done, uh, spelling is, is hot garbage because spelling doesn't really tell us that much. Uh, some letters are consistent. Like if we see a C, we know it's usually three or four different sounds. Uh, if we see an F, usually an F makes one particular sound. Uh, if we see a T, a T usually makes one of four or five different sounds. Um, but something like O-U-G-H, uh, it's not very helpful. So uh, the IPA gives us a system for taking sounds and putting it into a system that we can write. So every single time we see a symbol in the IPA, we know it means one specific sound. So the IPA is great because we can take any sound in any language and we could write it down. So if I say a word like map, instead of writing uh, M-A-P, I could write it in the IPA. It looks very similar. That's why I use the word map. But I know exactly how this is pronounced because anytime I see those three letters, they always make the same sounds. So that M always makes M. That A looking thing always makes A. Uh, that P always makes a P sound. So you can do this for every language on earth. And if you can read the characters and pronounce the characters, then you can pronounce any word in any language. So let me show you uh, what the IPA looks like. Uh, so here's the IPA. And we're not learning this chart because uh, there's a lot of stuff here. So here's all the consonant sounds uh, in all the languages that you can make. So the top here tells you where in the mouth it's made the different parts on the top of your mouth. Uh, on the left here, this tells you what the air is doing in your mouth. And these are the specific symbols made when you put the um, place and air flow together. 
uh, here's like clicks. So where the click is made, here's when air is going into your mouth instead of out. Uh, here's when you eject air at the same time. Uh, here's some different things you can do to the sounds. So if you make a puff of air at the same time you produce a consonant, you give it a little superscript. Uh, so you can customize your sounds very carefully with these symbols. And then here's a little vowel chart. So we're very specific with our sounds. We can take a person's voice and transcribe the sounds exactly as they produce them. So the question in chat is, does it change based on a person's accent? Yeah, we can transcribe a person's speech exactly. And we can customize uh, how they produce their T with these things called diacritics that tell us, okay, is their T a little bit creaky or breathy? Um, are they using their lips a little bit more when they produce a T? Is it closer to their teeth? Is their tip of the tongue being used more or is it uh, a little bit behind the tip of the tongue? We can be very specific. Uh, is their vowel a little bit more nasalized? Is the air going through their nose or not? So the IPA is a wonderful system for pronunciation. So that's what the IPA does for linguists. Uh, phoneticians use this very heavily and it's great for recording people and how they talk. It's also great for learning languages. Uh, if you know the IPA and a dictionary has IPA pronunciation, then you can learn how to pronounce any word. You don't need to rely on a native speaker to tell you how to fix your pronunciation. You can just look at a dictionary, you can read the description and you're good to go. How many diacritical marks does it have? Uh, the answer is a lot. I think it's something like 40 different diacritics, 40 different diacritics-ish. Um, there's also an IPA for people with um, speech disorders. So people with cleft lips have their own specialized IPA chart that are specifically for them so they can transcribe people with speech disorders too. So we might be able to take a look at that when we talk about uh, neurolinguistics. Okay. So let's take a look at the vocal tract and we're not gonna learn all the different parts here, it's too much, but I just wanna talk about how speech works. So when we talk, uh, we start by taking air into our mouths. So air can either go uh, through our oral cavity or it can go through our nose, through our nasal cavity, and it goes through our vocal, colds, uh, vocal, vocal folds, down our glottis, into our lungs. And in some languages, they shape the air with their tongue and produce sounds going in. In English, we don't do that. We only produce uh, sounds coming out. So we won't really talk about the air going in, uh, but what happens is air comes out and as air comes out, uh, we make a, a few choices with our air. Our first choice is at the vocal folds in this area. We have a choice of vibration. So either our vocal folds are going to vibrate or they're not. And what you can do is you can sort of put your, your hands around your throat. Be careful not to choke yourself. Um, yeah, don't, don't choke yourself, please. Uh, so if you make an S sound, you're not going to feel any vibrations on your throat. But if you make a Z sound like Z, Z, you'll feel some vibrations on your throat here. You might have to move your hand up and down. You can also just use a finger or two fingers if that feels a little bit better. But if you change between s and z, s, z, you can feel the vibration. So an S is called a voiceless sound because there's no voice. That's what we call the vibration is voiceless. No, no vibration is voiceless. And then a vibration, z, z, this is called voiced or voicing. Z. So that's like the first choice we make. Uh, we have another choice when air comes out is we can either send the air outside of our nose or we can send the air outside of our mouth. So this is gonna depend if you wanna make like an N or if you wanna make something like a T. Because if you make a sound like an N or an M, like mm, 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 air just goes out the nose. But if you wanna make like an S, like S, air is coming out of your mouth. 
Uh, and as air leaves your mouth, you're doing things with your tongue and your lips, and you're changing the shape of the air. And that's what's producing different consonants. So uh, this is generally the process for producing sounds. So we're not focus, focusing really much on how the sounds are being shaped in the mouth. That's something you do in an intro linguistics course. What, real, what we're focusing on is the vibration aspect and just learning how the consonants are pronounced and how we can listen to them and differentiate them when we hear them. So uh, don't worry about all the labels of the parts of the mouth here. Um, by the way, if you're a little bit confused on what this diagram is, this is just turning your head sideways and uh, chopping it right down the middle. So uh, side profile exactly as is. So there was a question a couple of weeks ago, uh, how do we differentiate consonants versus vowels? And here's, here's the thing, because in, in your life so far with consonants and vowels, uh, you have learned consonants and vowels just as letters. Uh, vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and consonants are all the other letters. But here's more of a linguistic definition. Uh, consonants are any sounds where the airflow in your mouth or your nose is blocked or impeded. Now, what this means is like something like S. S your tongue is so close to the roof of your mouth. You can feel that the airflow S is, is very restricted or something like a T or a P, puh, puh. That airflow in puh is being completely blocked by your lips, puh. In something like M and M, 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 airflow is being blocked by your lips, M, and it's being redirected through your nose, M. Uh, in something like Ch, ch, ch. Again, air is being stopped a little bit behind this hard little ridge at the top of your mouth. Ch, ch. So airflow is being blocked there. Compare this to a vowel. If you make a vowel like ah, ah, you know, you go to a doctor's office and they say, say ah for me, ah. You know why they tell you to say ah, right? Because it puts your tongue back and far. This is the furthest back and the furthest lowest that they can put your tongue if you say ah. And there's no impeding of that airflow in your mouth. Uh, or something like oh, oh. Air has a lot of room in your mouth to move. A, uh, A, same thing, a lot of room for airflow. So consonants have strict airflow and vowels have free airflow. So why do they say that Y is sometimes a vowel? Well, that's because in a word like yes, yes, y, y, the sound that yes is making in y, or so the sound that y makes in yes, y, it's being impeded a bit, y. Yeah, it's called a semi-vowel here. We're not really going to talk much about semi-vowels. Yeah, it's very close to the top of the mouth. Yeah. It's a little bit like a consonant there. But in a word like my, I, I, that's a vowel. So this one is very clearly a vowel in terms of how the airflow is being produced. But in a word like yes, uh, this is more like a consonant. So that's why we say it's sometimes a vowel, because all we have are the letters. So in some cases, it's more consonant-like. Sometimes it's more vowel-like. That's why the English spelling isn't always the best way to go when we uh, talk. Sorry, an ambulance just <laughs> went by my street, so my sentence sounded a little weird there. I was a little distracted. This is the full truth. Yes, it's almost the full truth. Almost the full truth. We're not talking about semi-vowels, so it's not the full truth. Okay, so here's the consonants for Ling 100, and uh, you don't need to know this stuff. Um, and I have a link for an, 
uh, an IPA chart, and I want to show you this chart so you can actually listen to these things. Uh, they have everything here. So if you ever want to hear what any of these sounds look like, you can just click on this. And I believe I still have sound shared. So uh, here's like a, a B, for instance. Ba, a ba. I mean, you, you know what B sounds like, but let's say you hear, look at this symbol. Here's something we haven't seen before, a theta. Tha, a tha. So whenever you see this theta, it makes a sound like, or whenever you see this one. Sha, a sha. So you can actually listen to these different sounds. Uh, just a little side thing. Um, but let's not take a look at this chart for now. It's a little bit scary at first. Uh, let's actually take a look at the consonants, and I've separated them in a way that is more um, approachable. So first thing, a lot of these consonants are already consonants you're familiar with. So here's the thing. In the IPA, we put these sounds in these little square brackets. And what the square brackets do is they tell us that these are sounds, not spelling. So if I see an F, in the square brackets, this means I'm pronouncing it as f. So for example, if I see a ph in spelling, I might pronounce it as f. So the spelling ph corresponds to the f in brackets, which means ph is pronounced as f. And a lot of the pronunciations that you would expect from these symbols are exactly you know, what they are in English. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on these ones. So if you see a P, for example, you know that's P. So like in pie and happy, that's the P. Uh, the B is the same thing as in the by or harbor. That's the B in by, the B in harbor. Uh, M, the M in mum. So M at the beginning of mum, M at the end of mum, or M at the end of ham. Uh, the key here, of course, is that it's spelling. So uh, the spelling does not always correspond to sound. So when we see the F sound here too, this corresponds to the F in flavor, but it also corresponds to the GH in rough, rough. So you'll see a word like rough and you might think, okay, uh, what, what symbol would be the, the last letter or last sound in rough? And I always recommend like, close your eyes. <laughs> Try not to think about the spelling of the word. Just pronounce it rough. Oh, rough. That sounds like an F. Okay, it should be an F symbol. Okay. So uh, we could go through a lot of these. Um, I, I won't point out any of the ones that I think are clear, uh, but what I will point out are things like the Z. So for instance, in dogs, let's think about this one. The S in dogs, when you pronounce the word dogs, z, z, that really is a Z. You're not saying dogs, dogs, I have two dogs. Really, you're saying I have two dogs, dogs. That's really a Z sound. So if you close your eyes and you say it, dogs, tables, um, uh, fads, um, marbles, a lot of those S's are actually Z sounds. And we talked about that a bit in the first week. Uh, another one with spelling would be like a K in uh, cling or a CK in stack. So again, we don't want to think too much about spelling. We want to think about pronunciation. So I hear um, stack, k, k, st, ek, k, k, or a cling. It's spelled with a C, but it's pronounced like a K, so that's the K sound. Uh, can the IPA represent specific things like vocal fry when it comes to accents? Yeah, you can put that in there too. There will be diacritics that represent that. And if none of those exist yet, then someone will create that. But for sure, that's probably something that already happens. I haven't seen any papers myself or um, transcriptions of vocal fry because that's not something that I've done research in. Um, but I know for something that it, that is something that has been studied before. Okay, uh, so I'm not going to focus too much on these consonants. 
Um, and again, we're not worried about the descriptions. We're not worried about where in the mouth these are made or how these are made. We're just worried about um, if you can hear a word or if you see these symbols, what sound do they make? So these consonants are the ones that are very clear. Uh, one thing I will point out is that sometimes you will see the R written as an upside down R. Uh, this is normal for the English R. In fact, I really should be using this upside down R. However, some linguists take shortcuts and it's Ling 100. So, you know, I'd rather just use a straight up R. Uh, don't tell any other professors, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, in English, we have seven other consonants with symbols that we have not seen before. So these are the ones I want to focus on. Uh, so these are the ones, if you do have to focus on any, focus on these. And I've written these in pairs. And I've written these in pairs because there's not much difference between any of these, except for the fact that in each pair, uh, one has vibrations in your vocal folds and the other one doesn't. And unfortunately, that's the only difference. So did you know that in English, there are two different THs? There's a TH without vocal vibration, and there's a TH with vocal vibration. Now, if you're a native English speaker, you might not have realized that. Uh, if you've learned English as a second language, you've probably been aware of that. So compare a word like think, think, and a word like this, this, and feel, feel your vocal folds while you pronounce that. Think, think. Th this, th this, thought, th those, math, rather, father. You can feel the vibrations on the th 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 compared to no vibrations on the. In fact, the voice this one might not even be picked up that well by the microphone. I I'm not sure. I might just hear it as static noise and filter it. Um, so the voiceless one is a theta. So this is voiceless. Uh, this is theta. It's the Greek symbol. It's pronounced the same way. So the same voiceless th as in theta. And this other one, it's like a D with a little squiggle at the top. Uh, this is called ev, ev, and this is the voiced counterpart. So when you're trying to pick which TH it is, you can always fill your throat and say, is it vibrating or is it not? Uh, those th or thought. So what's amazing is if you take the word thought and you just remove one letter, thought though, it just becomes voiced. So weird, English spelling is, is truly terrible. Okay. Uh, the second pair, uh, sh, sh, this is sh, so this is the voiceless one. This is in a word like ship. Some of you would know this as an integral sign. Uh, linguists know this as esh, esh. So this is like in ship or ashes or wash or ration, sh, sh, sh. And its counterpart is like a curly Z, uh, and this is called edge, edge. I think that's how you spell it, honestly. I've never spelt that by hand before. Uh, and this is sort of read as like a ZH or a Z, Z. So like in treasure or measure or azure or beige. And this is voiced. And to be honest, there's not too many words in English that are like actual English words that haven't been borrowed that use this sound. Um, I want to say that most of the words are borrowed from French or are one of these four words. So you don't see this one too often. Uh, yeah, a lot of French foods would use this sound when adapted by English speakers. So sh and j. And again, same sound. The only difference is this 
uh, vocal vibration. So sh and zh, sh and zh. Uh, we have these two symbols, uh, ch and j. So sort of like the, ch the ch versus the j or the dg. So uh, chip or hatch versus jump and judge. So you can feel again the difference between ch and j, ch and j, uh, cheese, watch, magic, bludgeon. So this is really a combination of two sounds at the same time. So if you do t and sh back to back, tsh, 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 and do them really quickly, ch, 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 you get that chip sound. Same with de je, de je, de je, 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 jump, judge, magic. Uh, that's what the tie bar means. It means that they're done like at the same time. And finally, the last sound doesn't have a pair, but it's a nasal sound. It means it goes through your nose. And this is the NG sound in English. Ing, ing, wing, bang, wrong. I don't know how many of you English speakers have known this, but there's a, it's not an NG. It's just one sound in the back, ing. It's the same place where you make the K sound, the G sound, but instead of going K or G, you just redirect air through your nose. So you close it. Instead of releasing that K, the air goes through your nose and you go, mm. Mm, wing, fang, wrong, sing. So that is like an N, and it's got a little sort of wing at the bottom, a little hook at the bottom. So uh, these consonants are a little bit more difficult than the other ones because, first of all, the sounds are a little bit more complex than the other because usually when we write these down, they use more than one letter. Um, but also uh, the symbols are different than what you're normally used to because we don't have these symbols in English. We don't have the theta or the eth or the esh or the little curly G or the sorry, little curly Z. We don't have the ang either. So uh, these might take a little bit more time to learn. Now, what I will tell you is that on every assignment you have to do, um, on every practice exercise, I'll give you all the symbols so you'll be able to see them in front of you. So what you need to be able to do is look at them and just know what they sound like. That's your goal. That's your job. Okay, so question. When we whisper, do we just use the voiceless sounds instead of the voice sounds? Yeah, that's what happens. When you whisper, you use the voiceless sounds. And you'll hear them in your head as voiced. But if you look at them and you analyze them in a program, they'll be voiceless. So I'll, I'll say a word like, um, buy my t-shirts on, on uh, Teespring. And whatever voiceless sounds or whatever voice sounds I had there would actually be voiceless. So uh, we'll take a 10 minute break. If you have any questions, save them. So that way we stay on time and then we'll do some practice exercises. Uh, so yeah, I'll see you in 10 minutes. That's the wrong screen. It's the wrong screen. Yeah, feel free to talk if you have a question. or type either either way uh, there is an IPA keyboard that you can set up through Windows but there's also a website online that you can use I'll link it in chat
Uh, we are not doing vowels in this course, so no, we will not be doing vowels in Ling 100. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to attempt a few of these. Some of these symbols might be hard to type, but uh, I don't know. Let's, let's just try a few of these. Unfortunately, there's not a nice way that I can do this with the polling feature because there's just so many options for these words. Um, so falling, what's the symbol for the F? Well, okay, I'll just, I'll, I'll give you the F symbol because it's, so the first one was an F, uh, the L falling, here's, here's a question for you, do, the, do those two L's in falling, is, is there one sound there or are there two sounds? Falling, if you pronounce it, it's just one, so it's just one L here for falling, and what symbol does that NG make? Okay, one, one person was able to type it, that's good. Falling, yeah, so this is that ng sound, that ng, that, that back nasal sound. So yeah, falling, ul and ng. Uh, simple, simple. So that first sound is an S, simple. Uh, what sound does the L-E make in simple? Simple, ah, just L. Very good. Okay. Uh, legendary. Legendary. What sound does the G make in legendary? Uh, if, if, if you're typing it, I won't be too picky with how you, yeah, <laughs> how you type it. Legendary. Yeah, the, the, the D with the curly... Yeah, so this is a J sound, legendary. If, if you could do the tie bar, you don't need to do the tie bar. Uh, legendary, so J. And then the D and the R are just normal here. Legendary, and I mean, that can be in a regular R or an upside down R, either one. Uh, the C in construction, what sound does that make? C construction. Okay, that's good. Some people are very tempted to write a C there, but the C character in the IPA is something very different. Uh, it sounds like a ch, ch. Uh, what about the TI? What sound does the TI make in the word construction? Construction, esh, integral, sh. Uh, left curly brace. That's, a, that's an interesting way of typing that one. I've never seen that before. Tall S, wavy sign. Oh, this is fun. Yeah, that works. Construction. That's good. Uh, marriage. Marriage. So M. Er. You'll be good with that. What about that last sound in marriage? Marriage. Yeah, everyone's copying the same one before. Okay, so that's good. Okay, last one. Chancellors. I, I want all three sounds for these ones. Chancellors. Ch, s, z, ch, s, z. Chancellors. Yeah, this looks good so far. Ch, s, z. So yeah, uh, chancellors is a nice word because all of the letters are, you know, are different than the IPA characters. 
So the first one here is ch. So that's like the ch sound ch. Uh, the c here is making an s sound chant solars, solars. Uh, this is a very, I mean, this is a French word. So, um, I mean, typically in English, whenever you have a C before the letter E, it makes an S sound. It's just conventional spelling, uh, not in every case, but in a lot of cases, especially when the word is French. Uh, and then in here, chancellors, this is the case where the plural is pronounced with a Z instead of an S, chancellors. So uh, there was some practice with consonants. Um, if this was challenging for you, then that's to be expected because there's a lot of consonants and uh, no one in their right mind can learn all of the consonants in 20 minutes. That's not normal. Um, it, it takes practice. It takes time. So that's what the practice exercises are for. And that's what uh, that little thing called studying is for that no one likes doing. Um, so yeah, you'll have some time to practice those with the practice questions and you have the assignment question that goes over that too. But are there questions about these ones before I move forward? Okay, as always, the deafening silence is great. Maybe. I have to interpret it as great because if I don't, uh, I'll never get anywhere. Okay, uh, so we talked about voiceless and voice sounds with the vibrations. Uh, I just want to illustrate what's happening here. Um, by taking a look at these two images and sort of like demonstrating with my hands what's happening. So I'm going to make myself slightly bigger, not too big. Okay, so I don't need to put myself there. It's just weird. I feel uncomfortable being in the center of the screen. Okay, so this is like a top-down view of your vocal folds. So when you have a voiceless sound like an S and you don't feel vibration, uh, these things right here, these lines, which I'll color in red, uh, this is what is either vibrating or not. And when it's voiceless, uh, so this right here is the front. You see these little muscles here. Uh, and the strings, your vocal folds, um, are loose. So when air is coming up through, you know, out of your mouth, there's not much tension in these strings. So there's no vibration occurring when air is flowing through. But when you produce a voice sound, what's happening are the bottoms of these muscles are being pulled towards the front of your throat. So it's pulling them down, which means that these strings, these vocal folds are getting tighter, they're getting tighter. And as air flows upwards into your mouth, because the airflow is fast, and the strings are tight together, the strings start to vibrate up and down because the air pressure is pressing on those strings and it's starting to act like a guitar string. And that's causing the vibration. So because the muscles are, are pulling the strings tight together and the airflow is making them vibrate, you get that vibration in your throat. So this is the difference between an S, a S, and a Z, like Z, the vibration. S, the strings are loose. Airflow is not pushing the strings back and forth. Zzz, the strings are tight together. They're tense and airflow is pushing the strings up and down very quickly. So that's what's happening, the difference between a voiceless and a voice sound. Uh, and in English, we have a few voiceless consonants and everything else is voiced. So vowels are voiced, uh, we have the voiced consonants. So you're much more likely to find a voice sound in English than a voiceless one. So you can either feel the vibration on your throat when you produce these sounds, or you can just memorize which ones are voiceless. It's up to you. I like using the cheat sheet, which is um, my hands and my mouth, um, but it's up to you. So uh, one way of doing this is just to learn pairs. So uh, all these little boxes here 
are pairs of sounds that are exactly the same, except one is voiceless and one is voiced. So P and B, exactly the same sound, except one is voiceless and one is voiced. But other than that, they're produced exactly the same. Uh, F and B, F, V, same sound, but one is voiceless, one is voiced. Uh, the two THs are the same. Uh, T and D, T, D, same sound, but T is voiceless, D is voiced. S, Z, same thing. Sh, Z, Ch, J, uh, K and G, same thing, but K is voiceless and G is voiced. Uh, and every other consonant in English is voiced except for the H, H which is voiceless. Huh, huh. Hi, hello, how are you? Um, so it's up to you how you want to approach that for remembering voiced or voiceless. Uh, either you can fill your throat, which is a great tip. Uh, and over time, eventually, the more you do it, the more you practice, it'll just become second nature. Um, eventually, uh, if you practice enough, you can even just feel it when you speak. If you, if you get in tune, or if you make your... Uh, the voice low enough and you can vibrate everything, then you can also feel it there. But not everyone can do that for obvious reasons. Uh, so I do have an exercise here where you can ask if each sound is voiceless or voiced, but for the sake of um, time, we're going to skip this. Uh, this is also one where because you already know the symbols and they're the same words, you can just check them yourself because you have the solutions here. So you can just check the chart after and verify it yourself. Um, so I'll finish with a little bit of info on vowels. You don't need to know vowels in the course, um, but just some background information on vowels. Um, so vowels are all about the tongue and the lips. So depending on how high your tongue is, how forward or back your tongue is, how tense your tongue is, and what your lips are doing, if they're rounded like ooh or o oh, or spread like e, or ah, uh, that's going to change the shape of your vowels. Uh, we have simple vowels. These are ones that are produced in a, a stable position like e or ah or oo, where there's no movement of the tongue. And you have complex vowels like i or a or uh, oi, where there's movement. So uh, the ones with usually like an ej, oj, oj. So these are the ones with two symbols back to back. Uh, these are complex. There's two symbols to symbolize that there is some movement going on. And ones with one symbol just means that there's no movement at all. And basically, uh, this shape, this is what's called the vowel chart. Uh, this is like inside of your mouth. So this tells you where your tongue is positioned in your mouth to produce that vowel. So uh, this sound here just means that your tongue is high in front. So e. this means your tongue is very up high in front in your mouth compared to something down back like ah, uh, ah, uh, which means it's down and back. So that's why doctors tell you to say ah, uh, because it's down and back. It's the furthest down and back you can go. It's, like, it's not like doctors are picking some random sound for you to say. Like There's a reason they tell you to say ah, uh, it's because it's down and back. So you don't need to know vowels, but just a little bit of info for you. Uh, so that's phonetics. Are there any questions about sounds before we move on to uh, sound patterns? Is an ah uh just a vocalized H? No, no. So with an H, like a huh, your vocal folds where the vibration occurs actually closes very briefly to stop air before that huh is released. But with a vowel like ah, uh, it just stays open. So versus ah, uh, ah, uh. that huh has a closure right in your vocal folds before release. There's videos of it, but I didn't want to show it because uh, it can be squeamish for people. Because it does look a little bit gross if you're not used to seeing stuff like that. False folds for vocalization. Are there languages that use them? Um, I'm not actually sure about that. I don't. I I don't know. 
I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't actually know about the answer to that question. In my experience, I have not heard anything about that. So I don't, I wouldn't say yes with my knowledge. Okay. Some would subharmonics be represented by the IPA. Um, there's some super segmental stuff that is not done by the IPA, but is done in phonology, uh, or is done on another tier above phonetics. So, um, not all of the sound stuff is done in phonetics. Some of it's done at layers above. So, um, phonology, when you talk about more as uh, syllables, intonation, tone, and things like that, um, uh, there's other areas of linguistics that deals with that kind of information. So phonology is like the next level above phonetics. Phonetics is about like properties of sounds. Uh, phonology is about patterning of sounds. And typically in a phonology course, uh, what you do is you look at how sounds differ depending on the environment. So of course, we don't have a lot of phonetic understanding to do that kind of stuff, so we can't look at it. But as an example, there's many different types of T's in English. Uh, most English speakers have four to five different types of T's. Uh, here's three different types of T's. So if you pronounce the words top, stop, and hat, uh, these are three different types that we have. And we saw this in the first lecture. So uh, top has an aspirated T. Uh, when you have a stressed syllable, T, you get this puff of air. Um, stop, this is just a regular T. There's no puff of air. And then hat, normally you just close your mouth and you don't release this T. So these all have different symbols. So these diacritics tell you um, how that base T is modified. So these are all T sounds, but there's slight modifications to them depending on how they're pronounced. But we can't talk about that because we don't know a lot of phonetics. So we're going to talk about things like phonotactics and syllables, which are, you know, uh, more interesting, I think, and also something that are more base level. We don't need a lot of understanding to talk about these things. So phonotactics is, you know, what sounds can appear together and syllables are how sounds are put together to form units. So phonotactics uh, goes back to our discussion about creativity. And uh, creativity and uh, phonotactic and our knowledge of all this stuff is just subconscious knowledge. As a native speaker of a language, you know what's good and bad. And as someone who learns a language, uh, over time, you pick up on these patterns, and eventually you can acquire a good knowledge of what is phonologically okay or not. So here I have some examples of what are called syllable onsets that are okay in English. And what I mean by syllable onsets is I mean ways you can start a syllable. So an onset is just a way you can start something. And syllable onsets would be the way you can start a syllable. So the blue ones are ways or words that we have. And uh, if it's red or brown, I can't tell what color that is. To be honest, it's somewhere in between. And my color vocabulary is about the same as a six-year-old's. So if it's maroon, ah, that's a word. Uh, that means we don't have it. So like, for instance, we have the pl and pr for play and pry. But in English, we do not have pl. Uh, these are not English words. If we have pl, typically if we hear pl at the beginning of a sound, or at the beginning of a word, it's like a child mispronouncing something. Uh, we can have tr and tw, but we don't have tl. English cannot have tl. Uh, you never hear anyone produce tl in English. Uh, not even children will do that. Um, but for some reason, cl, cr, and qu are okay. Club, crab, and quick. Now, if you ask why some combinations are not okay, the answer is, I, I don't know, like genuinely. There's no reason. It's just a descriptive fact of English that we don't have it. Why? Who knows? There could be some historical reason. 
but there's no reason we don't have pua. If every English speaker just started introducing pua words, we could probably pick it up and use it. It might just take a couple decades for people to do, but we could do it. Um, now in English, it's, it's nice because for a lot of these combinations, we can just put an S sound in front of it and we can still get words. So we can take pla and we can make spla. It's like split or pr and spra and we get sprite. But if we don't have pua, then obviously we can't get spua. So there's no pua words, so we can't get spua words. Uh, there's no tla words, so we can't get sla words. Sla, sla words. But at this point, it's hard to pronounce because we don't have those words, so we can't pronounce it. Uh, strike is fine. But here's an interesting case. Uh, we have TW words, um, but then we don't have STW words unless someone knows a stwa word in English, but I couldn't think of any stwa words. And when I Googled some, I couldn't find any unless there's some weird spelling. Uh, is there a branch of linguistics that studies why some of these are commonly used? Uh, computational linguists might look at these from a computing science aspect and just take a look at it. But uh, usually they don't look at why, they just descriptively look at which ones they have. Um, and then historical linguists might look at the language chain to see what influences might have been put into a language to find connections uh, historically, uh, language contact. Um, but normally it's not like why in terms of, you know, production, biologically why that happens. Uh, and then for the S's, we can do it with all the K's too. So uh, usually with phonotactics, we're just describing what can happen and what can't happen, and we're not really too concerned with why. Now, if we compare this to Spanish, uh, we find some, some differences here. So Spanish shares some similarities with English. It can have pl. Uh, what's interesting is that it can have pu. So English can't have pu, but Spanish can have pu. Uh, it also cannot have tla like English, uh, but it has tua, cla, and qua. So clava, cuadro, uh, tureto. Uh, that's fine. But suddenly, you put these S's in front of all these words, and Spanish no longer allows any of these. Uh, in fact, Spanish can't even have SP or ST or SL or SW or SK. Um, it can't have any two pairs with an S. So. Uh, you could really just say um, S with a consonant is not okay in Spanish. So, I mean, the, the main point here is that all of these constraints with phonotactics are language specific. So, you know, uh, Spanish has different constraints than English does, which will have different constraints from Mandarin and all these different things. Uh, furthermore, you know, the sounds are different. So like Spanish doesn't have an English R. So of course it can't have the same combinations that English does with its R's. So uh, when we think about like, what are they gonna do, Spanish speakers, when they come to English, I know we talked about this in the first week. So, um, you know, they hear an English word, that, let's say they hear the word school, well, they can't pronounce school in Spanish. So they're gonna try to take school and in English and they're gonna try to make it a little bit more like Spanish so they can pronounce it and say school because it's easier for them. It follows their phonotactics until they get more used to English and practice more until they can say school. So uh, some Spanish language Thanos snapped his fingers making S and constant not like English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. So uh, instead, uh, another thing to talk about is like not what other languages don't have, but we can talk about what other languages have that English doesn't have. And uh, I don't know how many people speak these languages because um, I can't pronounce half of these words, but like uh, Bantu allows an NT at the beginning of a syllable. So it's something like nto, nto. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it. Does anyone here speak? Bantu, can anyone pronounce these? Uh, if anyone can pronounce any of these words, feel free to jump in and say them, uh, especially the Russian one. Okay, Justin says we have uh, this word. Now, 
Uh, so what I want to say here, let me make this bigger. Because this, this, this is a good terminology thing. So if we take a look at this one and we think, okay, NT, NT. So the keyword here is onsets, starting a syllable. But if we actually break this up into syllables here, uh, how English would do it is we would separate the N and the T into two separate syllables. So we'd have U or U, however, people pronounce these in so many different ways, U, Bun, and Two. We wouldn't keep the N and the T together, otherwise we wouldn't be able to pronounce it. But like in Bantu, the N and T would be kept together. It'd be Nto, Nto, like one syllable. Um, but English would split it up. So like Bulgarian, it wouldn't be like vnuk, it'd be like vnuk, vnuk. Uh, again, I'm not pronouncing it probably the way it's actually pronounced because I need to insert a vowel to say it. But Bulgarian native speakers would be able to pronounce V and the N back to back without any vowel. So uh, I wonder if I can pull up Russian phonology fast enough to actually get someone to say this. Okay, here we go. I don't know if you can hear this, but this is a, a D and a V being pronounced back to back. So in English, we can't do that. And it might be very hard to even perceive at the beginning of that word. Uh, it is hard for me. Uh, here's another word with an R and a Z at the beginning of the word. Ржаной. 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 But these are examples of onsets that we do not have in English. Uh, uh, Mazatec allows the T and the S back to back. So it's a, it's a, a little bit easier for us. Actually, that might not be in Africa. That might just be tsa, tsa, tsa. But every language has its own uh, constraints. Uh, Tibetan is, in is interesting too. So we have the sound, right? We have the ng sound. Um, but Tibetan allows the ng to appear at the beginnings of words. English does not. English can only have ng at the end. So they can say ngab ju, ngab ju. English doesn't allow it. Uh, much like in the same way, English does not allow H's at the ends of words. English can only pronounce H's at the beginnings of words. We do not have any words that end with a H sound. We can spell words with the H at the end, but those H's are not pronounced. They're just usually a vowel. Uh, we don't actually say H. Huh. Like when you have a baby say wah, they say wah or bruh. We don't say bruh. <laughs> Bruh, bruh, we say bruh, not bruh. So we can spell it, but we can't say it. Bruh. But now you have the opportunity to make it a thing. It only takes 150 people saying it on the internet all the time to make changes. So go. Be the future generation. This is, this is your calling. Okay, and this leads into a discussion about gaps. So remember, at the end of the day, all of these words are arbitrary. So the fact that we don't have certain forms, like the fact that we don't have puente in English, or puabs, or, or flimped, or crucial, or, or, or clapadilly, it's just arbitrary. It's just chance. The fact that we don't have words like slurval, or to Schult or Mlackel Thorb, uh, that's because you know English says we can't have that because the phonotactic says that this is bad English. So some things are by chance, and some things are because the phonotactics and language and grammar say this is bad. So there's different words for each of these. Um, if we do not have a word form due to chance, it's called an accidental gap. So you can say, by accident, by chance, we don't have a word like flemped or crucial. So these are completely okay English words. 
or an another word like I don't know, like morgul. Morgul would be fine, um, but a word like slurble or a word like um, clipful, uh, you know, these can't occur because our phonotactics say this is bad. And this is what's called a systematic gap because the system, the grammar says, this is not an okay form. This is an impossible form. So uh, these are called gaps because if we were to list out all of the words in alphabetical order, or say all the possible words in alphabetical order, I say alphabetical order because it'd be an infinite list, um, there would be like a gap. We're missing this word. So we can either miss that word because it's an accident, we could have it, but we don't, or we're missing that word because it's an impossibility. So one word is accidental, one is systematic. So two different types of gaps. And there's a real discussion about these gaps. And I'd like to actually do a, a small activity with all of you here. So here, here's an actual, like a real activity. And after we do the activity, there's a, a small little question here. Uh, I'd like you to actually be creative. I know, I know, it's, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. It's almost dinner time, but we can be creative. I want you to come up with the name of a hangover pill. And there's some restrictions on this. It can't contain the word hangover. It can't contain any reference to alcohol. And it can't contain any reference to health benefits. Okay, so this is your task. You don't have much time to think about it. I'm going to give you one minute to think about it, and I want you to put the best name that you can come up with in the chat. And then in one minute, I'm going to put the best ones into a poll, and we're going to vote on the best three, and we're going to talk about those three. I just realized I only have uh, 10 possible options on the, on the, on the Zoom poll. So I have to uh, <laughs> pick, pick 10 on my own. Uh, well, that sucks. Uh, so... Norgale. Solica. We're going to go with these ones as choices. Uh, now, polls. So here's the poll. Please vote for your favorite here. And we're going to take a look at the top three and let you look at these questions. That seems to be a very clear favorite out of all of these so far. Wow. Oh, it's, there's one in the lead and there's a few ties behind. This is, okay. Uh, I'll just, I'll just put this over here. 
There you go. You can, I think you can see that. So bounce back seems to be 31%. Gray box. Can't even see. It's just a gray box. Well, that's, that's unfortunate. Well, we'll just eat that out of there. I'll just talk about it. Okay. So bounce back with 31% was the, was, was, was the winner here. Which two English words, uh, vivif vivifica, hard, hard to pronounce, hydrocillin and senzu, all 20% each, runners up, uh, vivamine, and then uh, nixer, night fixer, and uh, norgale were back to back. So bounce back seemed to be uh, very clear here. And What's interesting is that these are two English words. So very easy to pronounce. Uh, what's interesting about all of the ones that you submitted in chat is that all of these conform to English pronunciation. All of them. Now this is interesting because when you think about the vaccines, What's the most popular vaccine on the market for COVID? What's the vaccine everyone wants? It's Pfizer, right? It's Pfizer. And it's got some nice German spelling. It's got the P in front. Now, when you pronounce it, it's just an F. People don't actually pronounce it properly. It's not pronounced as, as, as Pfizer. Uh, it's just pronounced as Pfizer. Um, but because it's got that that foreign spelling, it seems a little bit more exotic and people trust it a little bit more. It's also the first one advertised, which can help. Um, but people reject Moderna because Pfizer sounds a little bit better. Um, the thing is though, if you stray a little bit too far and you use sounds that are not pronounceable, uh, people no longer like it. And it really does depend on the product too. Uh, when it's health products, when it's food, people don't mind things that sound a little bit foreign. And when I say a little bit foreign, uh, the word is European. That's just sort of the reality of things. Um, when things become unpronounceable or unfamiliar, people tend to not purchase the products. Uh, and there's a lot of research that is in marketing uh, and linguists are often employed to do that kind of thing. So it is a job that linguists can get is market research. Uh, specifically with the names of products. So a fun little activity. Um, is it also more memorable? Yeah, I mean, simple words, pronounceable words are more memorable. Um, so uh, a lot of French words too, even if you see the names of French products or Italian products, you'll notice that, like how many syllables do those words contain? One, two, three? How many foreign products will you see with four syllables or more? Or syllables with more than one syllable that's a little bit difficult to pronounce. A lot of them might be a little bit difficult to pronounce for just one letter or two letters or one sound and that's it. Uh, for the most part though, easy for the local population to pronounce, easy to remember because they're short. So a lot of market research goes into it. And a good thing with any product is you do what's called the grandma telephone test. You call up a local old person, you say the product name once to your grandma or grandpa, you get them to repeat it back. If they can repeat it back, you've got a good name. If they can't repeat it back, you ditch it, you try something else. That's your, that's your basic grandma test. Uh, it's a good test for anything. Remember that if you ever go into business and come up with a product name. Anyways. Uh, that's some creativity in real life. And you got to experience that and you kind of see the results of voting. Um, and you got to see it with the names you came up with, how they all sort of followed the rules of English. You could have you could have gone off the deep end and come up with something really crazy, but you didn't. Even though you had total freedom and creativity. Okay, last bit in phonology, syllables. Okay, syllables. 
Y'all know syllables. Do I need to teach syllables? I do need to teach syllables. How many syllables does the following word have? Instrumental. Tell me in chat, how many syllables does the word instrumental have? Four. Y'all are geniuses. How many words does marketable have? Sorry, how many syllables does marketable have? Marketable. Yeah, it's okay. It's the same amount. Uh, how many syllables does the word Q have? One. You already answered before I even asked the question. That's amazing. Okay, so first of all, y'all are geniuses. Uh, and second, what's amazing is that you know it's not just based off spelling. You know it's not just based off the number of vowels. Um, because if you did, you would count one, two, three, four vowels, and you'd say that Q had four syllables. You know it's based off of sounds. So yeah, uh, syllables are based off of sounds. Yeah, congratulations. Okay, great. Um, linguistically, though, it's a little bit more interesting. And we can analyze syllables in a lot of different ways. Uh, it's Ling 100, so we do it the interesting way. We take a look at syllables by analyzing how children play with language. So children all over the world play with language and play language games. And they're not really taught language games by anyone other than other kids. And it's, it's amazing because they'll learn these language games before they go to school, before elementary school teachers uh, get in their heads and teach them things about language that may or may not be true. We're not being judgmental about elementary school teachers here. However, they're very wrong about a lot of things. But don't get mad at them. They're just doing their jobs. So uh, Bengali kids play this little language game where after a syllable, they add this word, pado. And what this game tells us is that kids who speak Bengali know what syllables are in their heads. Because kids do this consistently. They can be taught one or two words, just how to do this game, and then any other word they hear, they can do this with. And all kids will do this consistently. No matter like where they learn Bengali or which other kid teaches them, they'll do this the same with every other word. So if they're given a word like ish cool, they'll say ish fado cool fado. And this means that they can separate it into two syllables, ish cool. Uh, the dot means that it's, it's a syllable boundary. So ish is one syllable, cool is another syllable. Uh, if they get a word like school, they'll say school fall, school fado. This means that school is one syllable. If they get shoho yo gita, they'll say sho fado, ho fado, yo fado, gi fado, ti fado. And they know that's five syllables. So one, two, three, four, five syllables. Okay. So um, this is like an insight into the brain. Kids know what syllables are. So the claim here is that syllables are things that actually exist. Uh, they're not just some made up language thing that uh, we say exists to add some pattern to it. Like they actually exist in the brain. This is a real thing in language. Okay, so, so there's, there's a unit of syllables, but is, is there something deeper in a syllable? Can syllables be broken up into parts? That's, that's a more interesting question. And the answer is yes. Uh, in English, there is a little game called Pig Latin. And Pig Latin shows that there are parts of a syllable. So some of you might know Pig Latin, some of you might not. Uh, so here's a demonstration. If you have a word like riddle, you can go through the Pig Latin machine and it becomes the word idle ray. Uh, if you have a word like eat, you can turn it into Pig Latin and it becomes the word eat a. Now, here's a question. Based off those two examples, if you have the word strength, should it become ankh stray or should it become trength say? Uh, what do you think should happen here? Ankh stray or trength say? Ankh stray, ankh stray. First one, ankh stray. I mean, if you're an adult, it, it might not be obvious to you, but kids will always get it right. Uh, kids will always choose the first one. And, um, you know, as someone who does linguistics, I was curious about this. So a few years ago, I asked a very young kid to explain how Pig Latin was done. And I, I wrote that this is the explanation he gave me word for word. 
Uh, he said, take the first part of the word and put it at the end of the word and then say a. And you can imagine how totally useful this explanation is to me um, because I see this, the first part of the word, and I, I'm just like, okay, what the hell does that mean? Uh, what is the first part of the word? Is that the s or is that the str? Like, is it S or STR? Like, that's what I need to know. Um, but this, this is actually very insightful because the fact that the kid is able to say first part of the word means that he understands that there is a part of a syllable here. So this STR in strength, well, strength is a one syllable word. So yeah, this STR is part of a syllable. There's some unit of a syllable here, which means we can dig into a syllable and the kid is aware of this. So uh, what part of the syllable is that? Well, we have a nice little diagram for syllable. Uh, we're going to finish the syllable section and then take a break. So uh, this will be like another three or four minutes. So here's a little diagram for syllables. We're not doing syllable diagrams in this course, but I'll show you it. Uh, syllables can be broken up into three parts, uh, something called an onset, something called a nucleus, and something called a coda. Uh, the onset is basically the beginning of a syllable. Uh, the nucleus is the middle of a syllable. It's it's the vowel. Basically, syllables are built around vowels. And the coda is just like the leftover consonants. Uh, it's, I'm not exaggerating when I say it's the dumping grounds for all of the consonants that don't get put into another syllable, like the, the leftover strays. Uh, so in a word like stakes, st is the beginning, a is the nucleus, that's the main vowel of the syllable, and the x for stakes, that's like the leftover consonants that don't go in their own syllable. So uh, that's the syllable. Uh, we don't care too much about the structure, but we do want to focus on this thing called the rhyme, uh, because this is important for language acquisition. So, and this is really where we end off with syllables. Uh, we can classify syllables as one of two types. Either a syllable is open or it's closed. And I do need to move my cam for this. Um, we say that a syllable is open if in the rhyme, in the coda, there are no consonants. So what this means is that the syllable ends with a vowel sound. So in like hi, be, say, chew, cry, flee, plow, I, all of these words, all of these syllables end with a vowel sound. It means it's open. Uh, but a syllable is closed if it ends with a consonant sound. So for instance, a word or syllable like it or on or are, cab, ship, ten. Uh, these are all closed syllables. And we have little abbreviations for these. So when we see V, this just means a vowel sound. When we see a C, this means a consonant sound. So when we see like V, this just means it's one vowel sound. Uh, CV means a consonant sound followed by a vowel sound. So CV is I, like I, um, B, B, E, say, S, A, uh, CCV, cry, K, R, I, flee, U, E. Uh, CVC, for example. Uh, so just to finish up this section here, uh, how many syllables are in each word and is the final syllable in each word open or closed? Well, running, running, running. This is two syllables, running. Uh, let me just ask you, is the final syllable, ning, an open syllable or a closed syllable? Yeah, this is closed because it ends in ing. It ends in that ing sound. Uh, pretentious, pretentious. That's three syllables. 
Is that one a closed syllable or an open syllable, that final one? That's also closed, yes. Pretentious. It ends with that S sound. Uh, what about Hawaii? Hawaii. That's three syllables. Is that open or closed? Ah, that's open. Ah, this is the great of this. Uh, clubs. Clubs. One syllable. Is that open or closed? Closed. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Stuffy. Two syllables. Stuffy. Open or closed? Open. And potato. Potato. Three syllables. Open or closed? Open again. Fantastic. Uh, the closed was a, a Z sound too. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll take a 10 minute break now and we'll come back and go through morphology and syntax. Uh, those sections are a lot quicker than the other two. So if you have any questions, you can leave them in the chat or uh, talk over voice when we get back from the break. And I'll see you in 10 minutes. Let's resume. Let's resume the recording. We'll continue with the heavy metal and EDM and children's music next week. Let the whiplash continue. Okay, the last two units on morphology and syntax, which are about word uh, construction and sentence construction, and these will be a little bit quicker. So morphology is about morphemes, which are about uh, the smallest unit of meaning in a language. So these are like words and the components of words that mean things like the er uh, or or that like make things an agent like act and act or uh, or run and run er or things like the plural s that make house houses or um, the uh, third person s that make i run to he runs so uh, we'll talk about these, there's not really too much to talk about in morphology. A lot of the interesting morphology is not in English. Um, Old English had a lot of really interesting morphology, uh, Middle English as well. And then modern English basically said, you know what? Let's be boring. And how was that? So morphemes can be classified as either what are called free or bound. And basically, uh, there's an easy way to think about this. Uh, is if you have a free morpheme, it can stand on its own, and it's a word. You can pronounce it. So if you say uh, red, red is a free morpheme. It stands on its own. Simple. Okay, it's free. It stands on its own. Uh, bound morphemes cannot stand on their own. They have to attach to another morpheme. So for instance, I cannot just say li, like the ly. I cannot just say s the plural morpheme on its own. I cannot just say ing, uh, like running. I cannot just say ing on its own. It has to attach to something. Um, X is one of those special cases where X can be a word, but if I want like the prefix X, it has to be a bound morpheme. Or if I want the prefix anti, it has to be a bound morpheme. But there are cases where anti and X can be used as uh, standalone words. So uh, some of the prefixes, uh, free morphemes or bound morphemes, it, it depends on the context. So in a lot of cases with morphology, uh, we don't analyze it just on a single word. We analyze it on a word in context. So that's important. The words are always in context. So that'll clarify a lot of the cases where you're like, well, is X a, morph is a free morpheme or a bound morpheme here? Well, you'll have a word in context to check. Um, so that's, that's really the, the, the basics of free and bound morphemes. And uh, we usually, well, we don't usually, um, these in English, these bound morphemes are called affixes. So these are the general terms. Um, normally, you've probably seen these introduced as separate things like uh, prefixes and suffixes. Uh, prefixes occur at the beginning of a word, and suffixes occur at the end of a word. Um, but affixes 
are just a general term that mean both of those things. So affix is like the larger category and prefixes and suffixes are types of affixes. Um, pro is short for professional, not necessarily. Um, pro can also mean short for like, um, a pro in some cases is short for professional, but pro can also just mean like positive or like for something. Um, yeah. Uh, so when we get to the word, so, so, so morphemes are just like individual units. So uh, you can have free morphemes and bound morphemes and those combine into words. So a word can be simple if it just contains a single morpheme. So uh, what I'll say is that uh, every word needs a free morpheme. So if a word is simple, it has just one morpheme. So that morpheme is going to be a free morpheme. So simple words have one free morpheme, and that's it. So something like house. This has one morpheme. It's free. It can stand on its own. Cat, love, play, happy. Uh, you cannot take these words and break them down into, into any smaller component that has meaning. Like, uh, if I take happy, I can't break it down into hap and pee. Like, these do not have meaning on their own. Uh, I, I can't do ha and ppy. I can't do ha and uh, appy. Like, these don't have meanings on their own. So I cannot break those apart. Um, uh, complex words will have more than one morpheme. So for instance, if you have houses, uh, you can break houses up into house plus plural. If you have running, you can break it up into run plus ing. And sometimes you'll notice that uh, spelling things happen. And uh, this is just a way of saying that you know, sometimes the spelling of a word changes and in linguistics, we just ignore this. Uh, it, spelling happens, but we don't care about spelling. We care about pronunciation. So if you get an extra N, an extra letter in there or a letter disappears, uh, who cares? It just happens because of spelling conventions. It doesn't concern us. Um, another example is the word blackboard. If you take a word that, if you take a look at the word blackboard, um, you can separate it into two components, black and board. Uh, in this case, this is actually two free morphemes coming together. Because you can say black on its own, and you can say board on its own. That's fine. Um, but we also have a word like activation. And this is a much more complex word than the other ones. Uh, in fact, a lot of people, when they see this word at once, they don't see four morphemes here. But there are four morphemes here. Uh, this comes from the free morpheme act and then you attach the bound morpheme iv to make the word active so you start with act and then you make the word active uh, then you add another bound morpheme eight to make the word activate and then finally you add this uh, other suffix yun or ion to get the word activation So act, active, activate, activation. And basically, uh, when you make these more complex words, every single time you add a morpheme, you should be creating another real word. Okay, so when you're taking a look at these words and you're breaking them apart, if you're trying to figure out if it's complex, make sure that if you're removing morphemes or adding morphemes, every step you have a real word. So um, every at every step in forming a complex word, you should be creating a real word. So that's something important. Um, so for instance, uh, if, we take a, if we take a look at a word like progress, um, it's important that we don't take a look at this like pro plus gress. And that's because 
Gress is not a word. We don't have a word in English that is gress. Uh, we also don't have a morpheme in English that is gress. Like we, there's not a lot that we can attach a gress to. So um, because this is Ling 100, you know, we're not taking a deep analysis in words. I'm not giving you any of these uh, weird cases. Um, and the words that are created should be related in some sense. Like when you add morphemes together, uh, you don't get totally different words. Uh, when you add a morpheme to, like when you add a, a bound morpheme to a free morpheme, the meaning of the word is somewhat related to what you just had. Uh, so would propose work? Um, like propose is just a base word. Um, no, sorry, propose is pro plus pose. Since pose is a word on its own and propose, and you could make proposal, proposing, that would work. Propose would be fine. Some, sometimes the meaning of the word is a little bit abstract in a sense, but you can get there. But suppose, supposed, supposedly, yes, that's another good example. But again, this is Ling 100. I'm not giving you any tricky or weird situations here, any odd examples. But if you take a course like Ling 220, where you go more in depth, you might end up with some weird situations here. So one last terminology thing. When you end up with a word with two free morphemes like Blackboard, uh, these are called compound words. And if you've taken uh, ESL courses or if you were an elementary school student in an English uh, school, and you've probably done some exercise with compounds uh, before. If you haven't, then a compound word is just two free morphemes, two standalone words coming together. So let's do some practice here. Um, uh, we can just do this in the chat because these seem to be fairly quick for people. So. Uh, there's three questions for each word. Uh, first of all, is each word simple or complex? I'll, I'll give I'll give you a little hint. No, none of these are going to be simple. Uh, two, how many morphemes are in each word? And three, is each morpheme free or bound? So uh, let's just do frying together. So uh, you don't have to list what the morphemes are, but just like in order, tell me if it's simple or complex, how many morphemes there are, and then in order, if it's free or bound. So you can take 30 seconds or something to type it, and uh, yeah, we'll see what you get. Yeah, so complex, two morphemes here. Okay, so we have fry and we have ing. So fry is the free morpheme here. It's stand on its own because you can say you can fry something. And then ing is like the progressive action here or um, like a fry ing pan or something. So this one is bound. You cannot say ing on its own. Okay, uh, what about actors? I'll tell you, so I'll just tell you these ones are complex. So just tell me how many morphemes there are and which ones are free or bound. This one in blue. So a few three, a couple two for actors. Oh, the two has changed to a three. Okay, so 
Okay, so this will be a good discussion point here. So there are three morphemes here. Act, or, and an S. Now, uh, act is indeed free. So you can act. And the S is indeed bound. Uh, this is a plural S. It makes things plural. Now, what's important here is that this or is actually bound. So the in morphology, the meaning is quite important. So this is not the or that is like, uh, like this or that. Um, this is an or slash er that turns an action into a doer. So someone who acts, or so act is like an action, and this or turns an action into someone who does that action. Like a teach becomes a teacher. Uh, someone who runs becomes a runner. So this needs to attach to some sort of verb. So in this case, it's bound. This one cannot stand on its own. Uh, so the meaning does matter in this case. Uh, does a tractor tract? Uh, tractor. So, I mean, a tractor, a tractor is an object, right? A tractor isn't someone who tracks. Like this OR or ER specifically turns it into a person, someone who, uh, like if it was, like if, if you say a tractor, you can do a tract plus or, right? Or a chipper, like a wood chipper chip plus er, that would also work. It's the same sort of idea. Someone who chips wood with an object too. Uh, the difference between a tractor is that, is, is tract a word? I don't know if tract is a word on its own in English. That, that, that can depend. I haven't seen the word tract on its own in a long time. Maybe historically that's a word, urinary tract. Yeah, urinary tract. I don't know if it's tracked in the same context, though. I'd have to look it up. That's one of those weird cases. Not in the context of a tractor's tract. Yeah, that might be, uh, that might be historically. That might be an historical thing. I'm not quite sure in the same sense. Uh, tractors pull, contract. Extract, extract, retract. Yeah, I guess I guess tractor would be the same way. Yeah, tractor would work the same way then. A lot of the times it's it's difficult to ask yourself like it <laughs> is the meaning the same or not? Because if it's not used in English anymore, typically we claim that the morpheme is no longer present, so we don't analyze it the same way. And that's, that's usually a question for historical linguists. Uh, let's take a look at unreliability. Unreliability, this one's a little bit tougher. Four, bound free, bound bound, unreliability. Okay, never mind. Apparently it's, it's, apparently it's not tougher, never mind. Uh, <laughs> what am I talking about? It's, it's fine. Uh, yeah, un, rely, a bowl, and then you have this itty. So uh, un is bound, rely is free, and then you get reliable, which is bound, and reliability. So that itty is also bound. Yeah. Is a word only considered a compound if it only consists of free morphemes? Uh, if it has at least two free morphemes. At least two free morphemes is compound. So blackboards is also compound. Two or more free morphemes. So it can have, uh, is able strictly bound in that context? Yes. Yes. Reliable. So it, this is the uh, a bowl that attaches to um, verbs that makes it an adjective. If a bound morpheme was attached, it would still be a compound, yes. Yeah, if bound morphemes attached to, co to compound words, they're still compound words. Uh, 
unreliable. Why does it not break into unreliable? Um, because the root here is rely. Yeah, what Jasper said. Uh, the, the core meaning of this word is rely. It's the core meaning here is not liable. Like it's not about the liability of something. It's about whether or not you can rely on a person. Because if you take the core root to mean liable and you say reliable, you have this notion of the fact that uh, someone was liable and then they're reliable. So once again, they're liable, but you don't get this notion of once again, someone is being liable. Um, the, the meaning of this word is on the fact that you can not rely on someone. So the meaning does matter in how the word is constructed. Okay. Um, I'm going to very briefly talk about this slide and just talk uh, word categories. So uh, morphology will help us discuss uh, whether we have a noun, a verb, or adjective. And we'll use these things called inflections. So these are specific morphemes that attach only to nouns, only to verbs, and only to adjectives. Uh, all other types of morphemes are what are called derivational affixes. And we are not covering these in this course because there are hundreds and hundreds of derivational affixes in English. Well, in terms of inflections, there's only eight, and we're only going to cover six. So nouns. You all know what nouns are. Nouns are people, places, things, and abstract ideas. So things like trees, cars, phones, opportunities. And these occur after words like the, a, uh, my and this. But in morphology, how we can determine if we have something like a noun is we can look for plural s. So you can attach a plural s to many nouns. So words like tree can become trees, car can become cars, phone can become phones. And in some cases, we have what's called internal change. So when you have uh, nouns that are somewhat irregular, the vowel inside the word might change. So goose becomes geese. So we have a plural change here. And this is like another form of a plural S, but instead of attaching S, we just change the vowel inside. So that's one of the inflections that you can have. Uh, a second inflection is doing the possessive S. And uh, every single noun can take a possessive S. So you can just attach an apostrophe S. So bees, knees, there's an example. It's the knees of the bees. Cat's pajamas, it's the pajamas of the cat. Love's dangers, it's the dangers of love. Oh, it's so real. Um, so you can check for either of these two inflections. If you're unsure if something is a noun, you can just try it. Uh, you can say, oh, is opportunity a noun? Well, you can check, uh, uh, this is opportunities calling. Oh, that works. Okay. Must be a noun. Uh, yeah, some, some nouns don't change, like sheep or deer. So looking for the plural S might not be the best way. You might have to try a possessive S. So that's how we can find nouns. Uh, verbs are typically actions or states. So things like play, talking, uh, and leave and love, these are some very traditional example of verbs. Uh, typically, you're used to things like past tense ed, so like play can become played, jump can become jumped, and irregular forms happen here too, where you can get some internal change once again. So run can become ran, and either one of the vowels will change, or you can get things completely changing, so like go becoming went. And this is still a past tense form. It's just you have an entire word changing. Uh, one of the other inflections you have is what's called the progressive form. So is running or was feeling or are sipping. So basically what's happening here is you have a verb and then you have a form of be occurring right before it. So I call this like the is plus being pattern. 
And this is another way of identifying whether you have a verb or not. So if you say, uh, I have this word act in a sentence and I wanna check to see if it's a verb, you could say, well, can I say is, you know, uh, can I put is in front of it and then attach an ing where it is? Oh, is acting? Oh, that sounds good. It could be a verb in this context. You just have to check the context to see if it works out in that case. Okay, the last one that uh, inflections can tell you about is uh, the adjective. And adjectives are nice because they always describe nouns. So adjectives are typically easy to identify when they come right before a noun, like in a funny joke or smart students. Um, but sometimes adjectives appear after a word like is. So any of the forms of to be. And typically then the adjective goes like backwards, sorry, not backwards. So it'll describe um, the thing before is. So this day is fantastic. Well, fantastic is describing day. So that's the one case where the adjective will appear after the noun is when you see is or a word like feels or looks. I'll try to avoid these in this course because this isn't a, a grammar course. Um, the two inflections for this, you get the comparative ER. So any word you can attach ER to and you get the superlative EST. So this is like greater, greatest, smarter, smartest, flatter, flattest, happier, happiest. Uh, some words cannot take this. They'll take more or most. Uh, excuse me, this is not actually an adjective. Uh, this should be uh, happy, or sorry, not happy, uh, beautiful. So if you say beautiful, you cannot say beautifuler. You have to say more beautiful. So beautiful becomes more beautiful. You can't say beautifuler. Uh, or beautiful becomes most beautiful. You can't say beautifulest. It's a little weird. Can we explain why people get confused between the past tense version of sing, sang versus sung? Uh, I wouldn't say confusion. It's just that's how English speakers are. They hear one and they use it. Um, some people just omit the have. They omit the perfect. Um, like my grandfather, for instance, says, I sung a song versus I sang a song. It's just how he talks. And I say the same thing, too, when I don't talk academically because that's how I grew up speaking. Um, it's not really a confusion. It's just a dialect difference. Uh, if you're a second language learner, then it could be an error or it could be a dialect thing. So it's just uh, sometimes it is an error. Sometimes it just happens. Same thing with drank versus drunk. Okay, so let's do some practice here. I was cooking last night and my stove exploded. It made a huge mess that was super messy. Uh, what are the categories of each of these words? So our choices are nouns, verbs, or adjectives. And feel free to use these abbreviations. So what do we think about the word night? Noun, verb, or adjective? N, noun, N, yeah. So what we could do is we could make it the word nights or we could make it uh, nights with a possessive S. I feel like I'm in elementary school. Yeah, it's, might be a little basic, but it's good to cover it just in case. Uh, exploded, my stove exploded, noun, verb, or adjective, verb, yeah. So this already has the past tense on it. This is explode plus the ED for past tense. Uh, it made a huge mess. What about huge? Adjective? Yeah, it's describing mess, which is a noun right after it. And what about messy? Uh, noun, verb, or adjective? Adjective, yeah. So this is the adjective in a different position. Um, it's describing mess, but it's occurring after the noun. So it was a mess that was super messy. It's a little bit later. OK, that wasn't too bad. So that's morphology. Let's talk about syntax. Syntax is now about phrases. And we didn't talk 
that much about grammatical sentences, but again, to remind you, um, we, we did say one thing, and that's a grammatical sentence is about what native speakers judge as grammatical or not. It's about acceptability. It's not about what grammar teachers say is okay. It's about what linguists observe as being okay and what people actually say. So I am going to the store. That's fine. I go to store. That's bad. In Texas English, they say, I might could go to the store. Uh, in Canada, we look at that and we say, what the hell's wrong with you? And in Texas, they say, uh, no, that might could sound fantastic to us. So we say, okay, Texas, you do your thing. That's great for you. Okay, two concepts that we need to know in syntax. Well, three concepts, uh, subject and predicate. Okay, uh, here's, here's the basic version of subject and predicate. A subject is who or what the sentence is about. The predicate is what the subject does or how the subject is described. Now, sometimes people have difficulties with these basic descriptions because the basic description can seem vague. So yeah, I understand. So here's a trick to identifying the subject and the predicate. You can identify the subject by replacing what you think is the subject with a pronoun like she or it or they or he. If you replace the subject with a pronoun like she or it and it sounds okay, you're probably right. So in the sentence, this kid loves ice cream. If I think the subject is this kid, I can replace it with the pronoun she. And I get the sentence, she loves ice cream. This sounds okay. That's the subject. She loves ice cream. This kid loves ice cream. This kid is the subject. That's who the sentence is about. If I think something else is the subject, if I think just kid is the subject, I'm going to get the sentence, uh, this she loves ice cream. Now, this does not sound okay. This she loves ice cream. So kid is not the subject. I need more than that. So I know I've got the wrong subject if I think it's just kid. So that's a little trick you can use for identifying the subject if you're struggling. The other example, my last car made a lot of noise. The subject is my last car. So I can replace this entire bit here with the word it. And I get it made a lot of noise. Okay, I replace the subject with the pronoun it. It works. Therefore, I've got the subject right. Uh, if I thought it was just... Uh, I don't know, um, all this. If I thought all that was the subject, what I'd end up with would be um, it, sorry, it, lot of noise. Oh, that doesn't sound very good. Okay, I think I got the wrong subject. My last car made a uh, is not the subject because when I replaced my last car made a uh, with it, it doesn't sound very good. So that's how you can identify what the subject is. Um, the other trick for the predicate is that the predicate is just everything that's not the subject. If you know what the subject is, you know what the predicate is because the predicate is everything else. The predicate is what the subject is doing or the description of the subject. You can also replace it, the predicate with did it or does or do, depending on the sentence. So practice. Uh, these principles play an important role. What's the subject of the first sentence? We're just going to do the subjects. So first sentence, uh, what is the subject of these principles play an important role? Yeah, it's these principles. How do we know that? Because I can replace it with a pronoun. Uh, they play an important role. It sounds grammatical. So we know we got a good subject. Can a predicate contain another subject? Yeah. A predicate can contain another sentence within it that has another subject. That would be fine. Uh, what about two? Learners vary with respect to their motivation. Uh, learners is the subject here. That's what was said in chat. So yeah, we could say uh, they vary with respect to their motivation. So yeah, uh, learners here would be the subject of the sentence. Okay, what about the third sentence? What is the subject of the third sentence? This short chapter discusses language acquisition. So yeah, we could say 
it discusses language acquisition. We replace it with a pronoun, it sounds fine. Okay, what's the subject of the last sentence? Errors occur in all areas? Yeah, it's just errors. Fantastic. And again, just for the sake of completion, uh, they occur in all areas. We just replace it with a pronoun, it sounds grammatical, we're good. So a nice simple test you can do to check to see if you have the subject or not. And everything else is the predicate in that sentence. Okay, syntax is also about the distribution of words. So in morphology, you take a look at inflections. Uh, so what attaches to words. And in syntax, you take a look at where words appear in sentences. So you can check the positions. Or you can check to see if words are nouns, verbs, or adjectives, depending on where they appear in a sentence or what words they appear after. So nouns will appear after words that are called determiners. So you don't really need to know these words, um, well, the word determiner specifically, uh, but these are words like the, or my, or their, or many. So the car, my resilience, their fortitude, many runs, uh, the, the jogging kind, not the bathroom kind. Uh, so that's how you can identify where a noun is. You can take a look for a word like the and say, okay, well, if I see the word the, a noun has to be really close to it. Uh, verbs appear after helping verbs like is. So is going, oh, we see that ing there. Uh, we see these modal words like should or could. We see helping verbs like has or words like can or could. So that could be a way you could identify a verb. Um, adjectives will appear right before nouns. So much like we saw before. So you're all very good at identifying nouns, verbs, and adjectives. So if you do struggle with these, again, email me, contact me. But from what I just saw, everything looks quite good. So let's talk about two other categories instead. Adverbs. Adverbs cannot be identified with inflections. They have to be identified usually with movement. So uh, one way you can find adverbs is saying, uh, what are they describing? because adverbs typically describe verbs. They answer questions like how, when, where, and how often. Uh, are these rules just for English? Uh, typically, no. Typically, these rules will apply for every language, but the position that they're in and the inflections that they, and how the inflections appear might be different. So uh, the inflections might be encoded within the word instead of appearing on them. and the positions might be slightly different, but abstractly they work the same. So adjectives in every language modify nouns if they exist in the language. Adverbs in every language describe verbs if they exist in the language. So I guess the answer is kind of. In the abstract sense, yes. In the specific sense, no. If the categories exist, everything is, the definitions are the same, but how the inflections and how the order appears is different. But the, the general structure is roughly the same. How words modify other words is similar. Okay, so Examples here are like quickly swam. So quickly is talking about how the swimming was done. Rarely leave, that's a word like how often. Actually succeeded. This is like how you succeeded. Uh, now, how you can check to see if you have an adverb is you move it around. See, adverbs in English can move to the beginning or end of a sentence. So if you say the bomb was quickly diffused or the bomb was somehow diffused, you can move it to the beginning of a sentence or you can move it to the end of a sentence. So quickly, the bomb was diffused. The bomb was diffused quickly. Uh, somehow the bomb was diffused. The bomb was diffused somehow. Uh, I rarely run, uh, rarely I run, or I run rarely. Uh, sometimes one of them might sound a little bit weird, but typically either the beginning or the end of the sentence will sound okay. So that's really how you identify adverbs.
Yeah. Uh, English teachers are not very good at hiring at uh, teaching grammar. If you read a grammar book t- uh, written by English teachers, um, there's a lot of mistakes in them. Uh, when I go to chapters, I need to make sure I don't go with certain friends because they just get mad at how mad I get at uh, grammar books. It's 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 a it's a bad habit. It's a bad habit. <laughs> uh, they get mad at how mad I get at grammar books. I just I just read them. Anyways, okay. Uh, last thing, uh, prepositions. Prepositions are kind of nasty. Um, here's here's how I'll talk about prepositions. Prepositions have a have a. Okay, I'll just say it. Prepositions have a shit ton of meanings. There's so many meanings to them, and there's so many prepositions, and there's not really a nice way of introducing them. So, uh, here's how I'll tell you to figure out what prepositions are. When you have a preposition, you will always find a noun, usually within two or three words. So on the table, in the room, after class, with a stick, by hand, hand of God, for two weeks, near Jesse. So one way of testing this is whenever you think you have a preposition, you can just remove everything after that word and just stick a proper name there and see if that works. So if I think four is a preposition and for two weeks, I can just remove that and put my name there. And I can say for Trevor. And I can say, does that sound fine? Yeah, it sounds fine. It's probably a preposition. Uh, After class, after Trevor, that sounds fine. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably a preposition. So, I mean, it's not going to work 100% of the time, but it's going to work 95% of the time. And that's kind of good enough, especially with all the different meanings they can have. So, I mean, they can represent location, time, duration, manner, agency, possession. Uh, they can do a lot of things. And of course, like Link 200, a grammar course, that's something you study in detail. You tell, uh, you, you write out all the different types of prepositions there are, you specify them. Uh, this is not the course for that. This is just identifying whether you have prepositions or not. Um, so that's a little trick to figure them out for five categories. Um, so yeah, uh, before I go to the very last concept, are there any questions about the five word categories? I'll clear you think. Well, uh, the nice thing is that all the practice exercises this week are applied. So you'll have a, a lot of opportunities to make sure you've actually caught this stuff or not. Um, okay, last thing. Last thing. Sentence types. This will be, be the most straightforward thing, I think. Uh, you have declarative sentences and you have questions, also known as interrogatives. So declaratives are sentences that are either true or false, like my dog looks really cute in pajamas, or I fought the leader of the FBI in a mud fight and won. These are things you can say true or false to. So declaratives, uh, these are things you say all the time. And questions, uh, these are also called interrogatives, like interrogatives comes from the word interrogation. That's how I got the FBI in my head. And there's two types you need to know, and this will be uh, useful for first language acquisition and second language acquisition. Uh, yes, no questions, which are self-descriptive. So these are words or questions that you respond to with either yes or no. So did you know that Jar Jar Binks is actually the best character in the Star Wars universe? No cap. Or WH questions. So these are words or questions that start with uh, WH words, like who? or how. Uh, If you ask how is how a WH question, there's a W there and there's an H there. Uh, Don't argue. Uh, Or when or why or where. So who stole the cookies from the cookie jar? That's a WH question. So these usually ask for nouns or places or locations. So those are the two types of sentences or questions. Uh, 
Those are pretty straightforward. And sort of a preview of what you can do in Ling 220 if you do want to take the course on theoretical linguistics that we don't do in this course, but you get to draw little diagrams for all the different tree structures out there. So you get to actually take a look at the structure of a sentence and how words build into phrases and phrases build into sentences and how tense is done and actually diagram the different parts. So not quite what we get to do in the course, but everything does come together in the end. So uh, theoretical linguistics is something that I really love. Uh, it's a lot of puzzles, a lot of fun. Today was a real whirlwind tour, but the past two weeks we talked a lot about communication. And this is the first week we really get to talk about what language is and the different components of language. So as we went through phonetics and phonology and morphology and syntax, we didn't really get to talk about uh, a lot, but you know, we still got to talk about some of the basics and those basics can be really interesting. Um, they just don't get that interesting in only three hours, which is unfortunate. So uh, that's all I have for this week. Uh, but if you do have any questions, and you want to stick around to ask them, feel free to. Um, but that's all I've got for the recording. So I'll see you all next week. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the week. If you have any questions about the assignment, discussion board, email, all the regular stuff. And uh, yeah, see you.